This morning I am reading from Psalm 119, verses 102 through 104. The word says, O Lord, I have not departed from your law, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Amen. The Lord has blessed us in reading of his holy word. This morning we're gathered to worship. We're here to give him glory and honor and to go into his presence. But our God is a holy and righteous God, and we are sinners. We must repent of our sins that, that we may go into his presence, that he would accept our praise and our worship. We're all sinners. We all fall short. We need his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness. Would you pray a prayer with me? Would you open your hearts and your mouths? Let us worship in one heart. Let us pray together in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Mighty God, we know that you are the one and only God, and there is no other. You are holy and righteous, Lord, and we are sinners, unworthy, Lord. But you who made a way for us, Lord, and that way is your Son, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Holy One of God. Yes, Lord, you died on that cross. You became our sin, and we believe, Lord, and you were raised from the dead. And yes, Lord, you hear us today, and your spirit that raised you, Lord, is in us now. Help us, Lord, to worship you in spirit. Have mercy on us, Lord, for we repent of our sins, and we come to you asking for forgiveness. We want to come into your presence, Lord. We want to worship you. Oh, hallelujah. Praise your name. You are our God. Father, thank you. Thank you for your love, which is so great it's hard for us to understand sometimes. How you can love a sinful people like us. And yet, Lord, you give us hope through your Son, Jesus. And we are here to worship you and to lift you up and to praise you and to be filled with your joy and your goodness. Let your joy, Lord, fall upon us, Lord, and lift us up as we lift you up in praise and worship, Lord. Let us draw near to you. Every soul here, Lord, every person that hears these words, I know, Lord, that they're precious in your sight because, Lord, your Son died for them. Help us, Lord, to remember that, Lord, as we worship, to give ourselves to you, to put away the world. Don't worry about anything but coming into your presence, Lord. Help us, Lord, to do that. Help us, for we are weak. We are definitely weak. And it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Pray to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is the help and salvation. Are you here and now to His temple draw near? Join me in glad adoration. Pray to the Lord, who are all things, so wondrously praying us, a shelter beyond his wings, yea, so gently sustain us. As thou shalt see, how thy desire will help in, a grant in him for the ordained. Pray to the Lord, O let all that is in me adore Him. All that have life and will come now with praise and we for Him. Let the heart in, bound up and sing all again, I gladly praise you. Amen. Amen. Jesus, that's your name. Jesus, that's your name. 
Would you uh, please all stand with me this morning? And I'm going to ask that we go to the Lord and we worship Him. I ask that you please repeat after me. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Please take your seats, and as you're taking your seats, please turn with me to the book of Zechariah again as we continue through. We're in chapter 6 this morning, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. That's chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Sister Berghauser will read for us in the Korean language. Sister Berghauser, please. 오늘 봉독하실 하나님의 말씀은 스가랴 6장 1절에서 8절 말씀입니다. 내가 또 눈을 들어본 적, 내 병거가 두산 사이에서 나오는데 그 산은 구리산이더라. 첫째 병거는 붉은 말들이, 둘째 병거는 검은 말들이, 셋째 병거는 흰 말들이, 넷째 병거는 어룽지고 근장한 말들이 매었는지라. 내가 내게 말하는 천사에게 물어 이르되, 내 주여 이것들이 무엇이니까 하니 천사가 대답하여 이르되 이는 하늘의 내 바람인데 온 세상의 주 앞에 서 있다가 나가는 것이라 하더라 금은 말은 북쪽으로 나가고 흰 말은 그 뒤를 따르고 어룽진 말은 남쪽 땅으로 나가고 근정한 말은 나가서 땅에 두루 다니고자 하니 그가 이르되 너희는 여기서 나가서 땅에 두루 다니라 하매 곧 땅에 두루 다니더라 그가 내게 외쳐 말하여 이르되 북쪽으로 나간 자들이 북쪽에서 내 영을 쉬게 하였느니라 하더라 아멘 Zechariah chapter 6 verses 1 through 8 I looked up again and there before me were four chariots coming out from between two mountains mountains of bronze the first chariot had red horses the second black, the third white, and the fourth dappled, all of them powerful. I asked the angel who was speaking to me, What are these, my lord? The angel answered me, These are the four spirits of heaven going out from standing in the presence of the Lord of the whole world. The one with the black horse is going toward the north country. The one with the white horses toward the west. And the one with the dappled horses toward the south. When the powerful horses went out, they were straining to go throughout the earth, and he said, Go throughout the earth. So they went throughout the earth. Then he called to me, Look, those going toward the north country have given my spirit rest in the land of the north. Amen. May the Lord have blessing to read of his holy word. Let us pray, please. Our Father in heaven, Thank you, Lord, for this, your holy word, and thank you for this message, and thank you for the people who hear it and receive it. Let us all take it to heart, Lord. May you give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us this day, and may we draw near to you through this message and accomplish your good and perfect will. And may you and only you receive the glory from all this. For it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. This morning we have the eighth vision. And this vision here of these four chariots and their horses is the eighth, and it's the last vision in this series here of visions. This vision was, was not only completes the visions, uh, but returns basically to the same theme as we found in the very first vision. The Lord God, He alone is supreme over all nations and is working for the good of His people. Now I know in our weakness sometimes it's hard for us to see that, but God's in charge. Remember what I tell you always, trust God. Now the past visions, they focused on Israel's relationship with the Lord. Once God's people are in the right relationship with Him, God is ready to move forward, and uh, then with, He has an intervention here of the promise of the 
first vision. In other words, he's going to fulfill his promise, but he, we have to have the right relationship with him, or we can't claim God's promises if we don't have a good relationship. The Lord's people could not expect to see their spiritual, their emotional, and economic oppression finished and the kingdom of God coming in until their own relationship with God was right. I've seen this time and time again, with the, even today. People expect God to bless them and take care of them even though they don't have a relationship with God. And you probably know people that way. They expect God to bless them. They think they deserve God's blessings because they're a good person, but they don't have a relationship with God. If you have a relationship with God, then you can, then you can claim God's promises. And now here, God, he reverses the situation for his holy, repentant remnant, basically with a wave of his hand. You see, God's timetable is not determined by the need to punish the people who reject him. I hope you understand that. God's timetable is not tied to or determined by punishing people. His timetable, if you look at it from what I can see in God's Word, is set for the need of His own people to be purified and to be ready to enjoy what He has prepared for them. That seems to guide God's time more than punishing people. When that is accomplished, God will make sure that no outside power will stop their peace and enjoyment and fellowship with him. But he is in charge. You know, I've often asked, and maybe you even think it, why did God allow his people to go through suffering at the hands of the enemy that he was later, he was going to destroy them anyway? Have you ever noticed that? God... He knew he was going to destroy their enemies, right? He knew what was going to happen, and yet he let his people suffer. He's going to destroy those enemies anyway, so why would he do that? Well, the visions in which God delayed his judgment upon the nations which oppressed his people teach us something. When I was looking at this, and I kept thinking, why did God let his people suffer like that? Because he knew he was going to destroy the enemies. And I can tell you this is what I think I have discovered. And maybe you will disagree with me, but I think this is the case. It appears to me that it's more important to God to teach his people to trust him and follow him, even if they have trouble and adversity, than it is to punish his enemies. Think about that. He could, he could have destroyed our enemies, but he says, you need to learn. We need to learn. So therefore, that's more important to God than punishing those who are hurting us. Because he wants us to learn. He wants us to have a better relationship with him. And we're so stubborn sometimes, what do we have to go through to accept him and believe in him and call on him and pray to him. What do we have to have? Trouble. Because when everything's going great, we forget about God. We draw nearer to God during times of trouble. Maybe that's why God lets us suffer instead of punishing those who cause our suffering. Let's look a little bit closer here. Let's consider more closely the providence of God, which is now acting to sort of cleanse away the sinfulness of the earth. So we have the coming judgment, obviously, here in our Scripture. First, we have this coming judgment upon the nations in uh, uh, verses 1 through 3. Verse 1 uses the same phrase as before to indicate the start of another vision. I looked up again, and there before me were four chariots coming out from between two mountains, mountains of bronze. Now, despite the fact that Zechariah has been given numerous other powerful visions, 
he is startled here. He seems to be startled when he again lifts up his eyes and he sees these four chariots advancing from between two mountains of brass or bronze. The, the word is interchangeable in many places. The word for the two unnamed mountains is a definite uh, article here in the Hebrew, and which to me, it, uh, it shows that probably the hearers of this prophecy would have understood what these two mountains were, or who or where these two mountains were. The mountains were bronze, uh, bronze or brass, or maybe even copper. And bronze usually typifies purifying by fire in judgment. Remember, uh, it was used as types of religious judgments. Uh, think about back when the snake, uh, well, what kind of snake did uh, Moses lift up for people to look at? What was it? It was a bronze serpent. Remember that? Uh, they had been bitten by snakes and they needed to be healed. He raised up a bronze serpent. And this is what, it, so if they could be, because of their sinful rebellion, they were suffering. Now, the altars of burnt sacrifice at the tabernacle and in the temple, they, uh, which signified God's judgments, they were made of bronze also. Thus, the mountains are very likely the two neighboring mountains that are very significant in the Bible, Mount Zion and Mount Olives. And right between them, these are, these are the mounts where, from which God's judgment goes forth upon the world. Y'all should know, or those of you who know the Bible, should know that the Kidron Valley is actually between these two mountains. Lies between these two mountains is the Kidron Valley. And it's associated with prophetic scriptures where God's judgments come upon nations. Jews, Christians and even Muslims fix this valley as the day of the last judgment. It ain't just Christians, it's Jews and Muslims. They say the last judgment will be happening there in the Kidron Valley. Now, you know, although it's used a chariot, although it's used to transport kings and other notables, the chariots were particularly military vehicles. It ain't like today we all have our own chariots, you know, we all have our own cars. In those days, only the very wealthy, very wealthy and very powerful, or the army, are the only ones that had a chariot. And the designations of chariots would have really meant a battle in the ancient world. When, they saw, when he saw these chariots, he knew exactly what it was. This is a, something that's fighting a battle. And they symbolize God's power. And action's about to happen. And the, these chariots, they represent this action that God's about to take. And the number of the chariots is also very significant. I hope you caught that. The number four stands for universal or worldwide. I can give you some examples. Ezekiel 37, 9 and Zechariah 6, 5 talk about the four spirits or the four winds. And Isaiah eleven twelve talks about the four corners of the earth, the eternal uh, city called the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21:16 is a city that's built four square. Uh, so the univer universality of the judgment is indicated by four chariots. Now four chariots are pulled by four different colored horses. Another clue to their identity is in verse 5, which associates them with the presence or the dwelling place of the Lord. The focus here of the prophet, his description changes. It changes in verses 2 and 3 from the chariots to the horses which were drawing these chariots. And he says the first chariot had red horses, the second black, the third white, and the fourth dappled, all of them powerful. Now from verse 5 we know that these horses are going Forth from where? From the Lord. 
They're coming out from the Lord, just as the horses were in the first vision. Y'all remember a while back when we taught the first vision? I don't know if you remember it or not, but these horses, these chariots are coming out from God's presence. And there seems here to be a connection between the first vision and this last vision because both of them we find colored horses sent to patrol the earth. I hope you remember a few weeks ago when we talked about those colored horses and the significance of the very colored horses undoubtedly is connected with the so-called, I'll say, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Hopefully you know a little bit about that from Revelation. You can read in Revelation chapter 6 if you're willing. I don't want to go back there and read every Sunday from Revelation 6, but there's a strong connection between Zechariah's prophecy and the prophecy in Revelation. In the horses in Revelation appear in the same context of judgment riding forth upon the nations of the earth as a result of the opening the seven sealed books. Now, horses in those days were a natural symbol for strength and warfare. Again, most people didn't have their own horse. In fact, very few people had horses unless you were very wealthy or military, but primarily military. In those days, a strong army had a lot of horses, cavalry. And if they didn't, then they were slow and they were easy prey. So cavalry could move fast, horses very strong. These most likely represented a carrying out of God's judgment upon the earth. Now, this, this symbolic representation of the varied colors, horses, is something we need to think about a little bit, and this is what I'd like to put forward. The red horses harnessed to the first chariot is a color of blood and symbolizes war and bloodshed, basically. Revelation 6, 4, as an example, says, Then another horse came out, a fiery red one, and its rider was given the power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. The black horses harnessed to the second chariot symbolize mourning, sorrow, scarcity, famine, and even death. Revelation 6, 5 says, And there before me was a black horse, and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. The white horses harnessed to the third chariot symbolizes victory and triumph. Uh, Revelation 6, 2 says, I looked and there before me was a white horse and its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. The dappled horse is a little bit different. The dappled horse is harnessed to the fourth chariot may symbolize death by a range of many different ways, uh, such as violence or plagues or pestilence. In fact, Revelation 6, 8 says, I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. And they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So it's pretty easy to correlate the colors of these horses to Revelation. You can find it pretty easily if you, if you have a reference Bible. But it's important that we see it that way. Because what's going on is here, they're going forth in judgment. Zechariah again asked for help here in interpreting this vision in verse 4. He says, I asked the angel who was speaking to me, What are these, my Lord? Now, Zechariah wants to know what's the meaning here. He wants to make sure he understands. So he's particularly concerned with, about the significance of the chariots, for they've been mentioned in every verse so far. Every verse they've been mentioned. So he's, he is respectfully asking the interpreting angel some questions. 
And Jesus told us this. This is where he's, a point I want to point out very first. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, he says, Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. I believe that we can ask God for wisdom. And he'll give it to us if we genuinely want it for the right reasons. He gives us more than enough. Problem is, what he gives us, many times we don't use it anyway. In verse 5, we find the angel's reply. The angel answered me, These are the four spirits of heaven going out from standing in the presence of the Lord of the whole world. Now, when I see this, I see... And I hear this, I see these four chariots, they're declared to be the four winds or the four spirits of heaven. With just the designation uh, chariots and, uh, and horses, we might have the idea of a uh, lumbering or sort of slow, right? Because in those days, it ain't like they had an interstate to drive these chariots down. They were probably pretty slow because these roads aren't all that good roads. The Romans improved the roads and made them pretty good, but still, there, there was only, they weren't that fast, you know? But with this swift, uh, this pronouncement, uh, this is a powerful designation of spirits or winds, we can really, I think, more accurately understand them because these powers or these, these spirits are standing before the Lord of all the earth and they are the forces which shape the actual events in the world and possibly they've been assigned to go forth doing God's work, doing His bidding in different parts of the world. Now, the prophet Micah said the host of heaven in 1 Kings 22, 19, standing beside God's throne. Daniel in 7, 10 says, a thousand thousands served him and 10,000 stood before him. Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, he announced himself in Luke 1, 19 to the father of John the Baptist as the one who stands in the presence of God. Now, angels can also actually be called the chariots of God. Did y'all realize that? They actually can be called chariots of God. So these four chariots are most likely angelic beings or heavenly powers that have been with God all this time and now they're about to go out and do God's work. They're about there. And these celestial messengers of God stand in his presence and obey his word, going forth in joyful service and swift and as powerful as they can be because they get their power from God Almighty. Now, to stand before means to behold his glory in heaven. In our flesh, we cannot stand before God in his glory. I don't think our minds, our flesh could tolerate it. That's why when God came, he was usually in some type of form that man could comprehend or see and, and describe. But in heaven, they're standing there in his glory. They serve his glory on the earth, which is, that's their business. That's why they were created. That's why God made angels to serve him. They stand before him to receive orders from him and to give account to him concerning their services on the earth. Hallelujah. Angels are serving God. They're all around us. There's, there's probably a bunch of angels in this room right now. You believe me, right? I know there's at least a couple because everyone that belongs to God has a protecting angel. 
And I can show you that in Scripture anytime you want to. Let's talk about it. We all have angels that are protected us that if we belong to God. The Lord of the whole earth is a millennial designation describing the rule of the Messiah over the earth in the, vis- the visible kingdom age when he comes again. And the decrees of earth's sovereign ruler will not be frustrated. God is patient. He's patient and he's merciful, but he will eventually deal with sin and with those who sin against his people, (coughs) which is stated in verse 6. The one with the black horse is going toward the north country. The one with the white horses toward the west. The one with the dappled horses toward the south. Now the black horses go to the north country to bring about what? Famine and death. The chariot pulled by the white horses, which represent victory and conquest, they go toward the west. The horses going from uh, forth symbolize judgments upon the earth, and the chariot symbolize the angelic spirits uh, sent to do God's will. So, you know, think about this. You should know this. Uh, I've taught it and we've preached it and talked about it. Most of Israel's worst enemies came from where? They came from the north. They were Assyria and Babylon and Rome, and they invaded Israel from the north, right? And the dappled or the spotted horses, which brings judgment of pestilence and plague, goes to the south country toward what? Israel's ancient enemy, which was Egypt. Remember, Egypt was a land of bondage or slavery, and the judgments of the dappled horses may indicate freedom from bondage. Hallelujah. Now, the destiny of the enemies of the Lord's people is in God's hands. I believe that with all my heart. Our enemies, they're in God's hands, just like I am. The ultimate enemy is obviously Satan. And he uses people, and he uses nations too. He uses governments. He uses terrorists. I mean, you name it. He uses the economic system. He can use, because he is a prince of the world, and he can use a lot of things uh, that seems very enemy toward us. But they too, they're in God's hands. And he will deal with them as they deserve. In the end, God's going to fix everything. Maybe I have to suffer for a while. Maybe I hope I'm learning. You know, I know I'm very stubborn, and I know I'm very uh, thick-headed. And, and, uh, but I want to learn a lot. I want to learn everything God has for me so that my suffering will stop. Do you get me? Huh? The more I learn, then there's no need. If I can learn it all, which obviously I never can, but if I could learn it and take it to heart, then I would be better off and I probably wouldn't be suffering. That's the way I look at people who seem to have it easier than me. I'm thinking, they learned a lot more than me. Think about that. Those who, why am I suffering and he's not suffering? Maybe he learned more than I did. Think about that. Did you notice that the red horse chariot was not addressed by the angel? Anybody happen to notice that? He only addressed three of them, not four of them. Now, we don't know why that is, but that's what's there. In verse 7, the horses are straining at their harnesses. They're eager to fulfill their mission. He says, when the powerful horses went out, they were straining to go throughout the earth. And he said, go throughout the earth. So they went throughout the earth. When I read that, I was thinking about these horses. They're wanting to go, and the rider's holding them back, you know, and they're just pushing, jumping and lifting up, and they're ready to take off. They're anticipating it like a racehorse or something, and, but they're holding them back. That's what I think. Uh, that's what I see it. And when these strong spirits come out from the presence of Lord, they were eager to go about their task that God had given to them, and that was protocol patrolling the whole earth and they were had been restrained until the right time 
And the strong chariots or the military host realize that the whole earth is in bondage of lawlessness. Our societies are out of control. And they desire to bring their judgment on the whole earth and hope that people will repent of their wickedness. In other words, they want the earth to obey God. And that's the reason they're straining. They want to hurry up and go do their work because they know that will please God. I wish we had that kind of attitude that we're straining to serve God, that we want to do His will. You know, what's holding us back? What's keeping us from it? When we come to God's presence in worship, we too should be very eager to perform the task that God has given us. But yet, we become lazy and too comfortable. Our time is always the right time to walk in the light as long as we have light. Remember this. Let's walk in the light while we have the light because darkness is coming. Maybe we're at twilight right now. Think about that. The rest after judgment. The angel of the Lord calls out to Zechariah in our last verse here, verse 8. Then he called me to me, look, those going toward the north country have given my spirit rest in the land of the north. Here again, we find the special attention given to the north. Now, why is the north such a focal point? Well, we look to Scripture, if we look to Scripture, we find that this is a country north of Israel that's deserving special consideration, and that is the country of Babylon. You remember, Babylon is really in a lot of prophecies, isn't it? And in the end, there's going to be a great battle up there, pretty close. You know what I'm saying? Y'all remember that, right? If you remember the previous vision concerned the latter-day Babylon, what? It was a worldwide, what? Economic and political and religious system, right? That uh, persecutes the uh, remnant of Israel, the latter-day church, us. It's no wonder that upon this Babylon, certain and special punishment would be put out, you know, vented. So let us not forget that the enemy of the north reestablished an ancient kingdom of Babylon will be the apostate, uh, apostate religious system attempting to become God itself. And God will not forget that. God will not forget and these powers of Babylon, which so pollute and contaminate men's souls and minds, they are going to face God's wrath. And the chariots of God will not return from the land or the north until what? God's Spirit can rest. That's what I get out of that. They're not going to return until God's Spirit can resist. But I want to encourage you this morning. The Spirit of Yahweh, God Almighty, is not only the Spirit of judgment which destroys what is ungodly. That's not the only thing He does. He also lifts up those that are related to God and have a relationship to God. This vision only sets forth the judgment of God upon the earth, but also he cleanses the world by his spirit in preparation of what? The coming of the Messiah and his millennial kingdom. Hallelujah. So he's, he, they're not only punishing, they're lifting up and preparing the way for the Messiah and for the final church. Hallelujah. And one day there will be a final battle. And he's preparing for it. So in conclusion, this last vision emphasizes God's initiative and his control over events that occur on this earth. And it, it actually presents divine intervention 
uh, intervention in Zechariah's day and the overarching truth of God's ongoing control over everything. Now, God has not loosened his control over what happens on earth, even though it may seem like it. It is uh, governed by the spiritual goals that God himself has set. God will not allow godless Babylon to continue long unjudged. Oh, I pray for more patience and understanding for me. I'm hoping you're praying the same for yourself. And God, you know, he hasn't forgotten his promise to establish the Messiah's throne of righteousness on Mount Zion so that he may extend his rule over the whole earth and bless all his people by his reign. God's not forgotten that. Again, I call, this calls for patience and endurance on our part. It's an appointed goal of history, God's goal, that everything is moving toward. Y'all realize that, right? Everything is moving toward God's final goal. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't even know when it's going to happen. But God has given us signs. And signs are all around us. That the wise Read the signs. Let those who don't know study and try to get understanding. You see, because when that rider on that white horse appears in the eastern sky, the final judgment and blood cleansing of the earth will happen. I look forward to that day of the presence of God will not be far away. It will dwell upon the earth for a thousand years. His glory will be seen. You know, right now it's by faith. Someday it will be by sight. And these eyes, or the spiritual eyes I get replaced with, is going to see that. Hallelujah. And I'm going to be really yelling hallelujah on both days. And some of you are going to be yelling with me, hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for being the loving, wonderful God that you are. We know, Lord, that you are in charge. And we know that time is marching on and we're going toward the end, your final goal, Lord, your final plan. We are headed toward it, Lord. Now, Lord, we know we don't know when, we don't know how, we don't know very much, but we know, Lord, that you're God Almighty and your will will be done. And you're in charge. So help us to trust you more and more. Help us, Lord, to be more like Jesus, to accept him and to worship him and give him glory and honor. So, Lord, you are the one that saves us, nobody else and nothing else, only by your grace in Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we do pray. Amen. Let's all stand, please.